thank you, everyone. I should, um, or I just want to flag that this is, what I'm going to present is we're basically going to come up with a number. And the person I've been working with is somebody called Alfred Lehar, who's at the University of Calgary. The reason why we wanted to do this research is because uh, there's been a lot of discussion about decentralized finance. And in particular, NASDAQ, I'm a, I'm a finance guy, so I'm always sort of interested in finan financial implications. So NASDAQ has started to list a fund that's based along the principles or that invests in enterprises along the principle of decentralized finance. And so the question is, what can we expect from decentralized finance going forward? And the, the question that we're particularly interested in is, should we expect these kinds of enterprises or entities to behave more efficiently than the things that we typically associate with intermediaries, right? Are they going to extract rents? And the very specific thing that I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. And this is because it's essentially a very successful proof of concept of a decentralized finance settlement system. Okay. And so what do we do? Basically, we just go to the block, blockchain and we look at all the, all the blocks from the Genesis block up to November 2018. That's just sort of when we stop collecting, collecting the data. And so in each block, what do you see? You see the Coinbase, um, and that's just the block reward. And you can also calculate the fees that people who want settlement are paying to the miners, right? And the fees are just expressed as the differences between the inputs and the outputs. And we just get that data for each block, for each transaction in the time period. Okay. So it's going to be kind of important to sort of understand where our number comes from. Um, is essentially, if you think about miners' incentives or economic incentives, there are two things that are going to matter. One, the coin base. And that's just set by the code, right? Nobody can affect that. The, the fees that the miner gets that are associated with these transactions, this is something that basically has got a sort of economic component to it, right? And what do we find? We find that over this time period that we're looking at, there is frequently excess capacity in mined blocks. That means blocks are either empty or partially empty. And this happens persistently over the time horizon. There's not congestion. Also, if you think about the fees as being the difference between inputs and outputs, there's a huge heterogeneity. So different people are paying completely different types of money or fees to get their, process, their transactions settled. And if you just think about how um, economists think about capacity and capacity usage, this excess capacity in the presence of fees sitting around is consistent with what economists call price discrimination. This is essentially taking an action that means that people are going to bid more or bid higher or pay extra fees. And this is to the benefit of the persons who are essentially processing transactions. Mining pools, in as much as they basically reduce the number of separate uh, servicers or people who are processing transactions, in very, very traditional game theory, these essentially facilitate this type of price discrimination. Okay? Over the period we've got about, that we look at, which is over approximately six years, um, we have about uh, 600 million. Mining pools have been in existence since, say, 2016. So we're talking about basically $200 million a year in excess fees have managed to be extracted because of this use of capacity or strategic use of capacity. So in terms of the literature, people have been interested in the viability of the Bitcoin blockchain. And so they've sort of thought about who's going to come in and who's going to mine 
whether or not you're going to have sort of stability in mining. Right? And so to some extent, this is, this is the discussion uh, that we saw before. Um, but basically, people, uh, when they're thinking about this, typically think about um, the block as, um, uh, as running at capacity, right? More people want to have transactions than there is space, and so people basically bid higher as incentives to get their uh, transactions to go through and be processed. So all of these kinds of arguments are essentially happening in a world in which there is excess demand for settlement services and blocks are running at full capacity. Right? Um, how has capacity changed over time? Um, well, basically, there have been capacity changes in the blockchain. There was this sort of implicit limitation due to data design that got sort of solved in uh, 2013. And then, of course, there was the SegWit, which increased the block, block size by basically putting data outside the block uh, from one to four megabytes, right? So, I mean, those are the changes. So, does capacity constraint bind? So, what this shows is, um, the blue doesn't really um, turn out too well. The sort of blue background looks, uh, so we're looking over our time period, right? The blue background is the total number of blocks, right? The green is the fraction of full blocks, and the red is the fraction of empty blocks, right? Between completely full blocks, yeah, with a little bit of sort of margin of error because everything doesn't quite add up perfectly, right? And empty blocks, there are a lot of partially full blocks, okay? So basically, we're looking at a diagram that sort of sell, tells us that um, we're not operating at full capacity or the capacity constraints don't bind, right? Um, another way of thinking about capacity constrained um, is essentially just to think about unused capacity and we measure it, we sort of look for each block uh, we, we look at the distribution of essentially transaction size in bytes, and we sort of say, okay, what does the median transaction look like? And this just gives you unused capacity in thousands of median transaction size, okay? So there's basically unused capacity. Um, and in particular, you can, you know, you, you could process an extra couple of thousand, even on very, very high frequent, or it seems to be high capacity days. So there's a lot of excess capacity. Right? Now, why is this surprising? It's surprising because most transactions have fees associated with them, okay? So the dark blue is essentially the fraction of zero fee transactions. And the red is the number of transactions. So as the number of zero fee transactions goes down, essentially what you're left with is a white canvas that tells you that these are transactions who have fees associated with them, okay? And they're not just very small fees. There's a huge cross-sectional variation in the fees that are associated with transactions, okay? So um, these are in um, US dollars, the right axis, Bitcoin price um, in US dollar left axis. And this is during December 2017 when there was a lot of, let's just say, volatility, okay? Um, basically, we have just sort of massive differences in essentially the fees per transaction that were being uh, offered, okay? So just to put some numbers on this, there were transactions with fees that essentially were equivalent to over 10,000 US dollars, okay? Some of the transactions that were processed had absolutely no fees associated with them, okay? And a lot of transactions had fees that were very, very low, so less than $5.
If you think about any other good, it's very, very difficult to come up with a scenario where it's reasonable to have prices that range from 10,000 to zero for the same thing. It's just kind of odd, okay? And this occurs across blocks and also within blocks. Okay. Now, are these fees important if we want to think about remuneration for the miners? Okay. What this figure shows is, uh, shows a couple of things. On the vertical axis, you have the fees divided by block reward. That sort of essentially tells you how big the fees are per block compared to the coin base, which is what the code generates for successfully mining a block, okay? So it goes from zero to one, right? And basically the fees per block are obviously, or typically they're less than the coin base, but they're not completely negligible. So they're about 30% of the coin base, okay? The bright red lines are essentially um, when uh, capacity is changed. Okay, so what have we got? Hopefully I've convinced you up to this point that one, blocks are not necessarily filled to capacity. Right? Two, associated with each block are transactions that have fees attached to them. Combining those two facts together is kind of puzzling from an economics point of view because it says that people who are mining seem to be leaving money on the table, right? They're transactions that are sitting there that have a price associated with them and they don't mine them. Mining things with, uh, you know, mining transactions and mining empty are equally difficult, right? So why are they leaving money on the table? And the way we think about it is we basically go back to um, essentially uh, auction theory or to think about how you might um, affect um, how you pick transactions to get the highest possible price, okay? And we do it in a super simple framework. And we say that if you wanna think about people who are coming in who give transactions or broadcast uh, transactions. There are two types, and I'm going to call them a high type and a low type. The high type basically really want their transactions to go through, so they get a lot of joy from the, the transaction settling, and they also have a huge cost associated with waiting. Right? The low type basically get less joy from having their transactions go through, and they also pay a lower cost for waiting. So there are these just two types that are sitting around. And then we say, okay, let's suppose that we're in a world with these two types. Let's think about how much they would be willing to pay. We're gonna call them bids, but this is essentially in terms of fees. How much would they be willing to pay in order to get their transactions settled? Okay. So how do we wanna think about the world? Well, just think of a very stylized representation of what happens when a block is mined. There are a whole bunch of people who are basically sitting around in a mempool, right? and they're just twiddling their thumbs. The person who is mining the block, so we're calling them a servicer, basically they pick a whole bunch of people out of the mempool, of their mempool, and then they start working on that transactions to try and find the nonce. Then at some point, they find the nonce, those things are posted, they're part of the block, right? And in terms of the way we, we just sort of organize this model, we just assume that the mempool is then flushed so we don't have to actually keep track of who's sitting around waiting. And you'll see how that works in just a sec. Um, how would people value this kind of process? Right? 
Well, it depends if you're a high type or a low type. So here I've just got I representing whether or not you're a high type or a low type. Every time you broadcast a transaction, you know that there's a probability associated with your order going through or your, your transaction being settled at any point in time. That's the PI, okay? So I broadcast the network. Basically, um, it goes through with some probability. The way we structure the model, we kind of assume that, okay, well, if it didn't go through the, second, the first time, you come back and you post the same order and the same bid, and then you get the same probability, and then the third time and so forth, right? This is just sort of a modeling convention so we don't have to worry about too many details. But how are people valuing, uh, you know, being part of the blockchain? Well, it depends on what the probability is of their order going through. If it doesn't go through the first time, maybe it goes through the second time. So that's the one minus P times P. If it doesn't go through the second time, maybe it goes through the third time and so forth, okay? So that leads us to essentially what we're gonna call people's utility or valuation for participating in this system. Um, essentially, you know, because you can't recall your order after it's broadcast, you can't adjust your bid after it's broadcast, you can't change your fees. Essentially what you're looking at is you're looking at, um, you know, if it doesn't execute this time, maybe it'll be in the next block, maybe it'll be in the next block. So you've just got this massive long series, this, this sort of probabilities that your order's gonna go through. If you kind of sort of will wrap that up, essentially you have, you know, people's valuation for participating in this depends on how much they value instantaneous settlement, that's the V, how much they pay in fees, that's the B, and something that captures the cost of waiting. That's their cost per block, and essentially this one minus P over P, which is the chance that it won't get executed over the chance that it does. So this is just how people are gonna value transactions. Okay, then what do we do? Well, okay, we're in this world now where we know how people value a transaction going through, we know how costly it is for them to wait, and we know how essentially their uh, benefit of using the blockchain depends on how likely it is that any particular order will go through. Then we can say, okay, well, how exactly, how likely is it that any particular order will go through? Well, then we start thinking about the incentives of the miners. And we're gonna think about two types of incentive schemes. One, where the miners just flat out take the highest bid, move all the way down until they've exhausted the capacity in a block, and that's what they mine. We're gonna call that full capacity. The other thing that we're gonna think about is a situation where miners understand that different people have different incentives to put in transactions. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna manipulate essentially this probability that an order will go through at any particular block in a way that makes the people who are most desperate to have their transactions through bid as high as possible. Okay. So um, what happens if you essentially have what I would call competitive servicing, where they just move through the orders in the highest possible fee to exhaust capacity. Okay. Well, there are gonna be two types of people who arrive or who are sitting in the mempool. The ones who are really desperate and the people who are less desperate. If you know that the miners are basically gonna take the highest fees first, you just wanna be a little bit higher than everyone else. So the people who are desperate essentially just say, okay, I know there's a whole bunch of people who are sitting in the mempool who are kind of charging super low fees, below $5, whatever. I'm just gonna charge $5 and a little bit more. Right? That means even though they have a super high valuation for having their transaction go through, they don't bid super high they just have to bid a little bit higher than what they know sort of the median uh, bid out there is. 
In economics terms, what that says is the people who are really desperate, if you have a start with the highest bid and then exhaust all capacity, they're essentially just going to bid just a little bit higher than the lowest bid, and they're going to end up going home being super happy because they, what we call, they extract rent, right? They don't have to bid up to their valuation. What happens if there's discriminatory pricing? By this, I'm going to think about a world in which the people who are mining blocks adjust the probability that any particular bid results in an order being um, put into the blockchain. And they do it in a way to sort of manipulate the people that they know that are sitting there that want their transactions processed. Okay? So if you were a miner and you wanted to make sure that people bid really, really high, what are you going to do? Well, you know, if I see somebody who's bidding kind of low, I may or may not take their transaction. No, not going to do it. I'm only going to take their transaction if they bid really high. So what does that mean? That means that the people who are desperate to use the service and who want to make sure that their orders go through are going to bid as high as possible. In fact, they're going to bid up to the point that they're just indifferent between participating or not. In economics terms, what that says is, if the servicer can choose which particular transactions he participate or he decides he wants to process, he can manipulate those execution probabilities by essentially leaving um, you know, transactions just lingering in the mempool to the point where the people who are desperate to trade are basically bidding ridiculously high amounts up to the point where they're indifferent between participating and not. This is a way, essentially, of extracting rents. Right? Now, the cost for the miner is weighing off two things. One, by not processing all possible transactions, yeah, so my quantity is going to go down a little bit. A couple of transactions are not going to go through. But you know, if I manage, if I reduce that quantity a little bit, but I get super, super high prices from the people who are desperate, I'm golden. That's fine. I'm making a lot of money. Right? So that's sort of the intuition. Um, there are a couple of implications of this kind of thing, of this sort of arguments that we can look through. Um, but one of the implications that we think is kind of interesting is if you think what, what this means for the existence of mining pools. Right? So people have talked about mining pools as a way of diversifying risk. So if I'm a small guy, the chance of me actually finding the knots is really small. So maybe if we, we have a group together, we can sort of you know, share the risk of, of mining. Right? That's a possibility. In this type of pricing argument, there's another possibility. Right? In order to, um, you know, if, if you, if you, if you want to think about economic actors, who are doing something relatively sophisticated, like leaving transactions sitting in the mempool and ignoring them because you're trying to get people to bid higher, right? That only works if everyone else in the system is also doing the same thing, okay? So we call that sort of collusive equilibria. It doesn't mean that people are actually directly communicating, they're just seeing that, oh, okay, that's the strategy that you're following. You know what? I'm going to follow that strategy as well. And basically, um, you know, you can get what looks like non-competitive behavior by people who are just playing the same thing again and again. They're sort of and watching what other people are doing. Okay. So. If you think about some of the things that mining pools do, seem to be consistent with this idea. Okay? One, um, 
mining pools basically have, uh, con are concentrated, right? There's sort of a small number, relatively small number, that are basically um, mining, right? Two, we know that mining pools frequently sign the blocks that they mine, right? Why would they do that? Well, basically, if you sign the block that you mine, um, it tells everyone that, look, you were basically playing along and doing the, um, you know, taking what we would consider to be the collusive or price discriminatory type of action, that you were sort of participating in this, um, you know, restricting capacity or using capacity strategically. Okay. So, so far, I hope I've made the argument that if you have unused capacity, it allows you to uh, affect the probability that any particular order gets executed, which you can use to essentially price discriminate. Okay. Mining pools can implement this by by either mining empty blocks or by restricting the number of orders that they put into a particular block. And I note that it doesn't really matter whether or not this is strictly strategic or whether or not it happens for another reason. The economic effect is gonna be the same. The people who are desperate for transactions are gonna bid super high. Right? Um, we do a couple of sort of robustness check, checks that have to do with uh, competition. And um, we look at industry concentration. And we look at it industry, we define industry concentration in terms of essentially um, how many blocks people mine, okay? And Essentially, we find that the fee spread, so um, um, how likely you are to get extreme payoffs, right, increases the more concentrated uh, the mining environment is, and in a particular mining pool's um, aggregate share of mining activity, okay? So this is sort of consistent with the idea that there is essentially an exercise of market power. Right? And what are the economic costs of these things? Well, we saw that there were empty blocks. If there is no capacity constraint, there should be no fees. And so the fees associated with any transaction should be zero. But let's suppose that there are, there's a little bit of congestion. So we take a pretty conservative estimate of uh, maximum fees. Basically, we just look at the 10% quantile of the fee distribution per block. And we sort of try to estimate how much of the surplus from the really, really desperate to trade, how much of those very high types, how much of that was extracted uh, by the fact that this sort of capacity is being manipulated strategically, okay? And for the whole sample, we're basically around 600 million, right? Um, so approximately 200 million a year that comes about because this capacity is used strategically. So in conclusion, this Bitcoin blockchain is, I mean, super interesting for many reasons. But partially it's interesting because um, it's a completely unregulated market. So you can think about what kind of economic situations or environments arise um, absent regulation. Pretty much everything else we see is regulated, right? And empirically, we seem to see that there is unused capacity. The unused capacity in the presence of a very large number of quantities in mempools suggests that the capacity is being used strategically to get the highest possible fees from people who want to have their orders settled. 
okay? And, um, you know, um, over the entire sample, it's 100 million a year. Since the rise of the mining pools, it's basically been about 200 million a year. Okay. Thank you.